Okay, okay, ladies and gentlemen, I believe we are now live on Facebook. Good morning, it is Thursday 14th of May. It is 10 a.m. here in Queensland, beautiful Gold Coast, um, or in Brisbane, are you in Brizzy, Greg, Glenn? Yes, I am, Brian. It's a stunning day here too, blue sky, sunshine, and, uh, and no polar winds. <laughs> amazing, amazing. So, um, guys, today we're going to be talking about knowing your numbers and communicating with your team. Um, we're not going to get too caught up in the, the COVID scenario. We've had many discussions um, about that in recent months, and I want to put a bit of a positive spin on this as much as possible. Um, obviously, thanking Glenn for his time, um, which we know is uh, at a premium. Um, I believe we've got over 100 people that are registered for this. We will be saving this back as well for you guys to watch in your own time. Um, for those of you that have been living under, under a rock for many, many years, um, I will do a quick intro to uh, Mr. Glenn Richards. Now, um, some of you are going to know him as one of the faces of Shark Tank primarily, but before Shark Tank, there's many other things that went into, uh, into his career that got him into that position in the first place. So um, he's the founding managing director of an organization called Green Cross Vets. Um, you guys would know um, the, the, literally the Green Cross um, that sits around every single state all over Australia and New Zealand. He's also the co-founder um, of Pet Barn, um, which before that actually merged with Green Cross as well, I do believe. Um, he bought his first vet practice at the age of 27. And within 10 years, he had five clinics, um, predominantly up in North Queensland in Townsville. Um, and then what I didn't know, Glenn, I just found out as well, you had two, uh, two vet hospitals in China as well. Um, still, going, still going and still owned by uh, a small group of us that have been associated for about 20 years. So uh, Shanghai is still, still alive and well. Wow, that could be an interesting conversation um, about animals in China. And we won't get caught up on that at the, in a, uh, at the moment. But you then went on to build the Green Cross Empire uh, with over 200 vet hospitals, as I alluded to, across Australia and New Zealand. Um, Pet Barn um, and City Farmers, as they're known across Oz and New Zealand, over 300 stores and 6,000 employees. So for those of you that um, are sitting there with a handful of employees and thinking about the headaches that you get, hopefully we'll be able to extract some information from Glenn today on how you deal with that en masse. Um, you've now got a keen interest in um, health and allied health um, industries. So you're chairman of ASX listed Healthier and People Infrastructure, who we are also fortunate enough to coach. Um, many, many more um, I'll bring you to the table. You obviously sit um, as an advisor to us and a shareholder to ISR Training. Mr. Glenn Richards, welcome. Thanks for joining us. Thank you, Ryan. Nice introduction and reinforce that uh, you don't have a journey like Green Cross without uh, collaborative founders and, uh, and really great team members that, that uh, join your journey and uh, make your life a lot easier. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Um, and that's what I really want to kind of extract from you today in a, in a real lightning half an hour is over the last <clears throat> months getting on for two years now since you kind of joined us it would have been it was March 2018 that we actually went on to Shark Tank and, and acquired yourself Steve and, and Andrew um, the, the advice um, and the mentoring guidance and support that you've given us has been unbelievable so I want to try and get a, a little bit of that now and just give it out to the world in, in a turbulent time so what we wanted to focus on was numbers um, in business and then communicating with your staff so First question that, that keeps coming up, and, and I guess it's a question from, from me as well. I mean, I've only been in business, this is my sixth year, but when starting out in business, um, what are the key financial metrics that you think we should be looking to understand? What, what are the, the sort of staples? Look, probably the, the big one I, I, that I get disturbed about is lack of, lack of uh, creating a financial roadmap right, <clears throat> right at the start of your journey, and then reviewing your financial roadmap on a very regular basis and we're talking depending on on how tough your your journey is you know if you're in a cash crunch then you need to be reviewing your numbers you know daily weekly um, <clears throat> and monthly so look i guess on on the classic you've got to work out what the number one kpi is for your business so you are seeing that on a daily basis and your team members are seeing that on a daily basis um, you know, you always, you got to have revenue that's got to be going north. You, you're going to see what's dropping out as real profit. But what happens to a lot of businesses is as you become more successful, you start ramping up things like uh, more support in your management team, or you've got a supplier to um, say a larger, a larger um, customer. And then you've got to go and make widgets wherever they are. Um, and then you've got to put deposits down. Um, and you move into that, that valley of death, the cash flow 
crunch. So I'm a massive fan of cash flow forecasts and reviewing those daily, weekly, monthly to know exactly where you are in the cycle of cash generation. Um, because so many businesses I bump into uh, run out of cash, even though they are successful at the top line, their revenues are coming up nicely. And there's this paradox, the more successful, there's this period of time for a lot of little businesses and medium businesses, the more successful they become, the more danger there is in falling over. So they, they run out of cash because the, the manufacturer wants payment, deposit down and get paid before you get your goods. Um, then your customer will want a 30, 60 or 90 day term. So you run out of cash and that can be in, in, uh, in, in product industry, but it happens in service as well as if you are building up your corporate team or your management team too fast, you suddenly wake up one day and you, you think you've got a lot of profit, but you've actually got no cash in the bank and you can't, you can't pay your staff. So I'm a big fan of knowing your daily cash balance, very big fan of, of uh, reviewing your cash flow forecast and your financial roadmap. Um, and uh, for me, you know, we, we do a 90 day reset. So we're looking at operational and uh, financial numbers on a 90 day basis in terms of strategy, but on an execution basis, you're at them daily and weekly, um, that number one number in your face daily, and then your sort of group of KPIs that you're monitoring, you need to look at them weekly. Um, for me, in the, when we're in the vet world, when I see CEO, I want to know, the daily cash balance, I want to know the daily revenue numbers by every single clinic. Um, I want to know um, the workup rate, how many fees were generated by each consult my guys did. And then I want to know on a monthly basis, uh, what were the fees generated per employee hour? Fees generated per employee hour. So I know you how productive each of my teams were um, and not in a ruthless way, but just, you know, in a vet hospital, you're in business. So you've got to work out what number you're watching closely. And for us, it was how much was generated per consult and how much generated per employee hour, which then sat nicely under your revenue line and your profit line and your cat daily cash balance. Yeah, yeah, nice. And um, I love the way you broke that down. And just to dissect that a little bit further then, so, per, so cash revenue per employee per hour, do, do you have a ratio of what that should look like against their hourly rates or their salary? Correct. So, so you'd have a, you know, what was generated. Um, we knew what our basic costs were. And then we knew if we're sitting on that number, we were well and truly on a, what we call optimum. If our guys were generating more than they should, they're over servicing our, our clients and we'd lose our customers. If they're under servicing, I mean, they probably weren't doing good workups. They weren't practicing quality medicine, uh, which then disturbed as well. So there was all this sort of optimal number range that you, you worked on. So generation of, of how much money we were making per employee hour gave me a good, a good indicator by team if they were sitting in an optimal place. One, not outpricing the market and not, and not beating up our clients and, and being too ruthless. But on the other side, doing good workups. So there was pr um, practice quality medicine and, and that gave us a snapshot of how that looked as well. Yeah, nice, nice. Um, and is there is there a guideline for you as an investor? Um, you've done this many times now. Is there is there a guideline in the investment world um, of what is classed as, as good growth in business um, as a, as a percentage or weekly, monthly, quarterly? Oh, look, it, it's by industry, isn't it, Ryan? And I guess um, someone like me who's an active investor and, and uh, mentor now, it depends on. Uh, whether we're in a tech, a really tech-based industry, is it an online business? You know, what's the cost of finding a customer and how much operating profit do we make per customer? Um, there, you know, different stages of a business, you know, you'll ignore the fact that you've got uh, development costs and marketing costs if you're, if you're uh, uh, you know, if, if you're working through. So for me, um, you know, you, you still got to have a good look at all financials, revenue growth, profit growth and by industry, you know, if you're a health company, that's a slower growing business, you're attracting new patients and new clients um, you know, from day to day, week to week. Um, if you're an online business doing retail sales, you know, there's a point where you go from burn cash to absolutely printing cash because you've now attracted enough of a customer base to generate great profits off the cost of 
operating that that tech platform. So it depends what business you're in and, and uh, your KPIs will, will reflect the type of industry you're playing in. Yeah, yeah, okay, that makes sense. Um, and then probably from us, because I, I give you a shareholders report every single month, um, as, as we should, to keep you, uh, keep you updated with where we're going. What are, the, uh, what are the red flags? I mean, forget businesses if they don't have shareholders, I get that, but what are the red flags that we're looking for numbers-wise in business anyway? Look, I, I love to see the cash uh, report. So, you know, there's three, three, you're looking at the balance sheet. Yeah, well, how much debt's sitting there? That's important. Um, how, how strong your, uh, uh, you know, how much cash is in the bank. That, so review the balance sheet, review the P&L, but I love the cash flow um, financial reports because that gives me um, a deeper understanding of, of the ins and outs and how long it takes to generate cash. And a lot of businesses uh, are damn good at driving revenue. They forget disciplines and processes around things like cash collection, um, keeping keeping uh, um, you know your your bad debts under control. That that basic stuff that you know when you're a small business and a medium sized business, you may not have a full team of, of um, financial uh, people on and accountants on the team. You have to do that. You know you've got to have. And with zero these days, you know, you can pull the, those out quite nicely, those reports, review them. So whenever you send me a report, mate, I'm looking at how much work you've done. That's great. How much you're invoicing, which is a revenue line. But I'm also then looking at what's the cash balance in the bank and how long is it taking you for our, for our clients of ISR to pay us? Because if we get to let that blow out, all our employees are expected to get paid on a, a daily or a weekly or a fortnightly basis. And if we let that run out to, you know, 60 day period of collection, we're going to run out of cash. Yeah. Okay. So when we talk to businesses in, in the startup phase, we always, um, obviously talk about spending a disproportionate amount of your time on revenue generating tasks. The important part is actually driving cash into your business. Um, yeah. Can you quantify the amount of time they should be spending if they're a one person bank um, or they've got a small team, how much should they be spending doing their numbers every week? Uh, look, you, it's a discipline you've got to have. I remember starting my vet clinic. I, I was uh, chief vet. I was chief marketing officer. I used to write all my own newsletters and create marketing plans. But I was also the bookkeeper for the first two years of, of uh, and I had end up with about 12 staff. And I was still doing the books because I wanted to deeply immerse myself in the numbers. And so you can glance at a PL and and you know whether it's right or wrong. And, and that's pretty important for small business to... Yes, hand that over as quick as you can, but at some stage of your business journey, you want to have been touching those numbers so you, you, you can feel it. You can glance at your, your, your uh, daily KPIs, your weekly KPIs, your monthly P&L and, and cash flow and balance sheets, and you know whether it's right or wrong. And that's an important part of, I guess, an entrepreneur's journey to be financially literate. Uh, and to have those, I guess, fiscal disciplines in there. But look, at the end of the day, most of us who are entrepreneurs, we're damn good at driving revenue. We're damn good at probably the marketing and sales functions and the ideas. The next hire you want to put into your business is someone who's damn good at the, the admin and finance side so that there's at least someone on a regular basis keeping an eye on the numbers for you because it's not a natural um, flow for a lot of entrepreneurs to be across detail. We're big picture people. We're great at selling a story. We're great at driving revenue. But you need in that team people who are damn good at the detail and the numbers. To, and, and so that's why you have a cycle of meetings, daily, weekly, monthly, 90-day uh, resets. With that team around you, you tend not to bump into too many big problems. Yeah, I love that. So one of the so one of the primary hires then is somebody that's got that financial literacy and that, that their job is dedicated to staying on top of this. I think. We, we got caught up in that. We were very good at driving revenue. Um, obviously, saw exponential growth since you guys came on board, but our expenses did the same. And it was um, only after speaking to you guys, we did our, we do our 30, 60, 90 day resets. We started to implement 30 day audits um, of all the subscriptions and all the expenses. And we had like subscriptions where we were on the top package where we didn't need to be on the top one. We could be on the lower one and it might only be $20 a month, but they all compound, right? So, oh, look, look, I. I've been there myself, mate. It's quite simple that, you know, we get so focused on driving business and revenue. And, you know, for me in Townsville, I, I had five veterinary clinics open. I opened a pet store <clears throat> and I ran out of cash. 
So I used the ATO as my, my banker for about nine months, which was very nice of them and uh, 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 eventually very sweet about it after a little bit of a tense conversation. But uh, uh, look, the reality is one of my most important hires was putting a financial controller uh, who also acted as, as sort of discipline and process and looking after IT, but her number one job was financial control um, of my group in Townsville and it changed overnight on how I thought about the business because she was putting facts in front of me with a different view to my sort of entrepreneurial driving view, which was good. You needed you need people to highlight the risks um, and to be mapping that cash flow. As I said, in deepest, darkest days of, of trying to find cash and using your credit cards, you know, I was monitoring my cash balance daily and trying to predict six months out when my cash was falling and was my bills were coming in and, and having a financial controller alongside me during that time was pretty important. Yeah, and what, what do you think or feel then about, um, say, so we can't afford to bring somebody in full time, just outsourcing that for five hours a week, $60 an hour, get yourself a bookkeeper. They're emotionally detached from the business. Is that, is that a good thing for us to do? Absolutely smart move. And, and, you know, it's what I should have done way back in the day. Uh, and it's now the number one thing I go looking for in any of the businesses I'm in is the fiscal uh, or financial literacy. And look, most people can't afford a full time. You're better off getting a part timer or a contracted financial controller um, who are, you know, smart. With, with things like zero, the bookkeeping must take care of itself now. But it's having someone in to assist with the FAS, but also give you another view, almost bring them as an advisor to the table yeah. to give you a, 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 an interpretation of those numbers, which helps you because, you know, we can't be all things to, to the business. We, and most of us as entrepreneurs are um, crazy revenue chasers, um, idea generators. Uh, and at the end of the day, it is good to have and, and I'd contract quite happily, straight, straight up, find a good financial controller. And there's plenty out there now in the business world that are happy to a, finan a financial controller contracted rate, come into your business on a weekly basis, sit down on a monthly for those strategic conversations as well as part of your, your team. Amazing, amazing. Okay, so um, you just referenced the, the word team then, which is a nice transition. Um, so. With, with all of these numbers, uh, when you've got a small business, sometimes you can give your staff too much information um, and, it, and it can, some people don't know how to, to deal with that. How much should we be sharing from a numbers perspective with our, with our staff? Uh, look, it, the, in a small business, you, I think you've got to let them know the revenue line, absolutely. Um, and some of the basic costs, just to give them understanding, because a, a lot of our employees look at the revenue line and think that's the profit line as well. So yeah. it's not... It's not, uh, it's not silly to be actually highlighting revenue and some of your strong costs. When we, when we were running Green Cross, we actually did a financial literacy program with our whole staff. Went into every single clinic and did a program around teaching them the basics of business and the basics of budgeting. Mm. And, and that helped them in their own personal life. But at the same time, because we're a public company, we were showing our numbers to the world every six months. So we, on a monthly basis, would show each clinic their full p &L how they're going, um, and, and that gave them an idea how successful their practice was and whether you know, they're in line for pay rises on going forward, uh, not to put pressure on them, but you know, there's a market price and then there's more than we can pay the market based on how productive a team is. So those sort of numbers are pretty important. In a small business, you, know, you probably don't want to be showing your profit line, but, but you, you do and will show them some basic costs and reinforce that, no, the number one, you know, I get going to, used to go into any of the pet barn stores. The guys can tell me in any pet barn store their weekly number, you know, their weekly number, how they're tracking against last week. Um, so, so there is some real KPIs that you should really get your team on the journey with so they get excited about it as well. That's why, you know, know your numbers and, yeah. and uh, revenue is going to be part of that. They're allowed to know the revenue. Is the business successful and, uh, and is it growing? That's important. Is it growing? And, and that's one thing I, um, we've really taken from you is, is making every single staff member feel part of the journey, right? Um, and if they are aware of it, you're not hiding anything. It's not like just come in and do your job. It's This is your business as well, right? Absolutely. And, and look, nice thing about, I think, a lot of Australian businesses now, we see the team as the number one asset. Um, and therefore, it's a collaborative uh, workplace that, that says, you know, we all do this well. It's a fun place to work in. 
but at the same time, if we're successful, then that success in a lot of, and a lot of businesses now will share that financial success across the team as well. Um, so, you know, at the end of the day, uh, I think it's important to, to have that team you know, not totally focused on the money, but definitely focused on the outcome we're looking for, which is our customers are exceptionally happy with who we are and the service and products we provide. Uh, and definitely want employees that are engaged with our workplaces that they see as, a, as, as an important part. I mean, over you know, COVID-19, we've been locked away from our workplaces. Workplaces are a really important part of our, our social well-being, uh, our mental well-being. So therefore, as leaders in our, in our businesses, we create a workplace, currently virtual, but normally um, that, that we want our employees deeply engaged with and part of a collaborative place where we're doing great work for ourselves as well as great work for our clients, patients, customers, whoever is coming into that business. Yeah, nice. Um, and as you as you then grow um, and you do start to increase that as team, you get to the likes of 6,000 staff members. Um, I understand that you're not personally managing every single one of them, but how do you how do you keep that culture um, of a small team um, as you scale? How do you stay personable to them and real? Um, have you got any sort of tips on that? Yeah, look, we, we were important to, to break it down so that we saw each business unit. Um, and for, so for us, a business unit was a clinic had a, a clear team leader. Uh, we had a practice manager and a senior vet. So they were our team leaders in each location. They were supported by a good area coach. So the area coach's job was to, to wander in on a, a weekly or monthly basis, depending on, on the cycle of visits, um, to support the team, to bring them together in their regions um, so that there was engagement across our, our clinics as well as within the clinics, um, share ideas across the group. And then the job of corporate was to support our area coaches. And the area coaches was this conduit of support between what we're doing, the initiatives we're developing in our corporate uh, area and helping pass that through to support our clinics be the best they can be. And, and you know, I, I, I've been watching Healthier and supporting Healthier through through the last couple of months. So as a board, we've been meeting weekly. Um, as a senior management team and the senior exec team, Wes and the guys have been um, logging on daily, doing webinars with, um, with the clinics, our, our podiatry, physio, hand therapy clinics, right across the group, keeping them informed about what's going on, um, keeping them on a war footing, saying and reflecting, you know, it's tough times. We're in this together. We will support you. Um, keep them up to date on things like JobKeeper. Um, but once a week, they always showed the revenue line versus where we thought we'd be versus, you know, where, where we are. So um, healthier, beginning of March, when it started to look, look like things were starting to get nasty in Australia with COVID cases breaking out everywhere. Um, we put the business on a war footing and said, right, what happens if revenue drops off level one, level two, level three, and level four, and then lockdowns are level one, level two, level three, level four. So we did a lot of work around predictions and we kept our teams informed of what would happen if revenues moved into those levels of, of, uh, of, of impact by lockdown and COVID-19 and, and things like you know, our board and executive team taking pay cuts. So that happened quite early. So everyone knew that we were going to be in this together, that everyone was going to take some pain um, and hopefully the pain wouldn't have to get passed on all the way down through into our clinics. Um, but very early in the piece, the board and the management, senior management team took pay cuts um, and thank you for JobKeeper coming through, you know, absolutely inspired program by the government. Um, it has helped make sure we had not had to put off um, uh, people in our organisation. I think, unfortunately, some of our casuals uh, had to go, but our part-timers, full-timers, we've maintained, and we will continue to do that thanks to JobKeeper. Um, but, but you know, at the end of the day, heard a beautiful quote uh, the other day from from a Vern Harnish uh, wrote some online, and uh, uh, the speaker was saying, you know, as a leader, we have to absorb fear and exude hope. Absorb fear and exude hope. And not in a not in a uh, you know a blindly optimistic way, but we have to give people hope that we will get through COVID nineteen. It is tough, and we keep our people informed. We're transparent about the impact and and where we're going. But more importantly, an absolute definite faith that we will get this organisation through. Your job is safe. 
and we'll get to the other side. Life will get back to something resembling where we've come from. But it may be a bit different. We may learn new ways of working using digital platforms and online interactions. You know, we've embraced telemedicine and health uh, and some of our other organisations. But at the end of the day, a leader's job is to make sure we're looking after our people, keeping that important asset protected and supported right through this. And so knowing that, that um, you know, mental health is real. You know, our people are locked up at home. Our employees, our teams are, are sitting at home. And, and uh, our job as leaders is to make sure we're checking in with them and asking other members of our organisations to check in with our employees. Give them a ring, give them a Zoom call, give them a, you know, have a party, uh, a house party on a Friday afternoon, whatever platform. We've got great tech these days to check in with our fellow workers as well as our, our leaders and our coaches checking in with our workers. Yeah, I love that. So c communicate early, communicate often um, and be that, be that light at the end of the tunnel. Um, really, it's time, time that the leaders have to stand up like we chose to be running a company um, and now that's where the, the, the staff need is more than ever. Um, all right, um, we've got literally three minutes. So I, I didn't want to let you go without asking you something half related to um, Shark Tank because it is something we get asked an awful lot as well since we were on the show. Um, when somebody's pitching you, which I know would happen every single day, everybody's got the best idea, right? Um, how do you prioritize the, the, the idea, if you, if you can process it? Are you looking at personality profile? Are you looking at the demand in the market for the idea, if it's feasible, or are you looking at the, the numbers? Like where do the numbers sit for you in that list? I think I work through a process because I sit there and get, trying to understand what they're pitching. What's the problem and what's the solution they're putting in front of me? Do I get it? Do I understand the product or the service that they're pitching? Do I like it? Um, do I, can I relate to it personally as an investor? Um, so it's, it's a bit of a gut feel on what do I think the market and how will the market respond? Because as an entrepreneur, we think we've got the best idea in the world, but at the end of the day, um, you know, you know, so, and have they done some market testing? Is there real revenues coming through? Is, you know, so, so that's important to me. Does the idea uh, or the, you know, is the problem big enough and is the solution useful? Then I look at the personality. Are they coachable? Have they put a good team around them? Because it's never about one person, it is about a team. Uh, are they a narcissist and uh, unlikely to want to listen to anyone else? Uh, you know, I come back to are they coachable and willing to have mentors around them and good teams around them because they're not defensive. They're willing to do this and they'll do whatever it takes, but they will need a good team to get there. And then we lift the lid on the numbers and, and we sit in those spreadsheets uh, with my, my analyst and myself and work our way through trying to test because everyone should have a financial roadmap. We get into their financial roadmap and their spreadsheets and try and see whether we agree with their view of the future in the financial side or on the financial side. And uh, at the end of the day, decide at that point whether we, we believe it's an opportunity worth pursuing and we'll part with our money and, uh, and invest. And, and my approach has been we, we generally will put money in and follow through with some time as well, be it a board role or simply as a mentor in the background every now and again. Yeah, well, I'll, I'll testify for that. Um, you've definitely given us an awful lot of time. Um, and what, what, I, what I took from that was almost that the finances were third. So it was, is, is there a market demand? Do you like the person? And can you see yourself working from them? And the financial aspect was actually last, which I think will surprise some people. Yeah, well, you know, show me the finances first. I might get too excited and I'll forgive the fact that I've got a narcissist that I'm trying to deal with. And <laughs> it'll go, it'll get ugly at some point with either his team or her team. Uh, it'll get ugly with investors. So, so, you know, you work through the process. Do I understand the service or product and how is it positioned in the marketplace? So I've got to get that part. But, mate, yeah, numbers are, are they're, they're the bonus. But, you know, obviously, that's the most important part. But the other two are really vital to, to work with. For sure. Um, and, that, and that is so aligned with, obviously, what we teach, as you know. Um, if people like you, they'll listen to you. If they trust you, they'll do business with you. So if you don't like us in the first place, we're not even getting to the numbers conversation um, to actually explain how, how fantastic we are as well. Um, any final nuggets that you want to finish us off with, Glenn? Look, I, I just reinforce, it's tough times. Um, it's important to have a really deep control of your, of your numbers and know exactly where you are financially and put some work into building a financial roadmap coming out of this. So you are ready to seize opportunities. You're conserving cash, your strong balance sheet. 
so that you, you, you know, at, and it's, it's so bloody competitive out there. You know, we're all going to be going after in our industries and in our place we play the same customers. We have to be better um, going after those customers, better service, better value for our, for our customers. And we've got to have great people to help us in that journey. So great team members. Um, but you've got to know your numbers and you've got to communicate with, with employees and, and your customers on a regular basis. It's going to be tough. Uh, but the reality is those businesses that are on the front foot willing to communicate with their, their customers, willing to look after their employees, they'll give that back to you in space in the way we, uh, we do business in the marketplace. So it's going to be tough. And uh, hopefully most businesses will be here in 12 months' time. Uh, but the ones that are on a, a war footing with, with the know their numbers, uh, that are willing to communicate w with their employees and their customers, probably the ones that are going to be uh, still here in, in 12 months' time. Amazing. Amazing. Thank you so much for your time. I do appreciate it. Um, I really do. I know how busy you are. Guys, if you enjoyed that, we've obviously now spoke to Andrew. We spoke to Glenn. Um, last, last little surprise for you. We've got Mr. Steve Baxter for you next week um, doing exactly the same. That could go absolutely anywhere. I have no idea what <laughs> Um, I'm probably safe for doing it via Zoom because I could just turn him off at any minute. Uh, but <laughs> we'll, we'll see how that goes. Um, Glenn, I'll let you go, mate. Enjoy the rest of your day. Um, I'll speak to you soon. Everybody else on Facebook, take care. Got any questions, fire them into us. Thanks, Ryan. Enjoyed the chat. Cheers, mate. Bye-bye.